Hi, this is Kevin Johnson, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on Casey Radio 97.7 FM. Okay. Um, how did your initial interest in, in music come about? Were your parents an influence there at all? Yes, my mother uh, was a violin player, and uh, uh, she tried to teach me violin at a very early age, but uh, unfortunately uh, I wasn't the size bit interested. I, I did. She did teach me for a while, but uh, then sort of gave up and thought I'd be better off playing with the kids. So uh, I didn't take any more interest until... Uh, you know, in my late teens of the music of the of the day then that suddenly I bought the first guitar and went on from there. So. There was a, an early band you were involved with there, the, the Candymen. What can, what can you tell us about them? Um, there was a band in Rockhampton. I, I started off playing at um, uh, uh, beer gardens and such forth around Rockhampton and... Uh, and uh, at the same time, we formed a band, and we used to play all the... Uh, it was a separate thing to what I was doing in the beer gardens, but um, we used to play all the Beatles records and the Stones and all of that sort of stuff, and uh, play at all the local, um, around that area, ba- pubs and clubs and whatever. Um, so, you know, that was the starting in the sort of rock and roll side of things. I believe you, you were still working in the, in the public service at a time that you were writing songs for uh, Cold Joy's publishing company, is that right? That's right, yeah. I, I, started, I, w- I worked in the main roads department in, uh, in Rockhampton uh, and uh, uh, then eventually moved on to Brisbane and then in the main roads department as well and then moved into Sydney uh, where I worked for a while the, Registrar Generals, uh, births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, so I had a history in the uh, public service, uh, but at the same time I was always writing uh, songs. Uh, at that stage, getting other people, other people recording them, and uh, I was uh, slipping out to uh, re- recording sessions and so forth and so on. And uh, and that's how it um, went from there. Who were some of the people you were providing songs to at that at that point? Uh, I first uh, my first recordings were with um, Cole Joy's label, the Jacobson's label. Uh, oh, just hang on one second, will you? Sure. Could you just wait one second? Sorry yeah, sure. That. No, yeah, no yeah. problem. Answer that, will you? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so I... Um, I started off with the Cold Joy, um, uh, the Jacobsons uh, label. They took an interest first, and uh, and then um, I uh, um, started with them. And I guess uh, people who were associated with um, their uh, record company, uh, um, or associated with their management or whatever of the artists, like. Uh, Carl and Little Patty and Judy Stone and Sandy Scott and those were the early uh, people that recorded some of my songs and then Tom Jones picked one of them up and then uh, at about that same time and uh, you know it sort of went on from there. At what point or can you pinpoint a a moment in time when you felt confident enough to to give away that or to give up that steady paycheck with the the public service to, to go ahead and pursue music full time? Uh, I don't think I ever felt confident about it, but I was a little more driven, I suppose. Uh, so I, uh, there was no other choice. I had committed uh, to doing certain things and moving from one place to another, and then you know towards the bigger cities. And uh, and so one is driven, I guess. Uh, after a while, you don't really have a choice in the matter. You got uh, you relinquished quite a few things on the way there, and uh, you got to keep going with it. What about the the deal that you struck with the the tree publishing company? How did how did that one come about? Um, I guess uh, uh, I think Bonnie, please don't go was a big hit for me uh, internationally. Uh, it was in the American charts. Somebody else covered it, but I had a lot of play with it in other places. And it was a big hit in Australia, number one and number two, somewhere all over the uh, Australia. And um, it was just about that time that they. Uh, contacted me and um, we uh, 
uh, signed a deal. It was a writing uh, deal and also a recording deal. And but after a couple of years, I could see we weren't really going anywhere uh, together. And uh, I asked to get out of the contract. And uh, that was when I recorded uh, Rock and Roll. I gave you so uh, it was. Um, it, it was a, a good company, and they obviously paid me every week to advances against future royalties and such forth. But uh, I couldn't see that we were going in the same direction, so, so I got out of it. Talking about Bonnie, Please Don't Go, did you see the hit potential of that song when you recorded it? Yes, um, I did. Uh, I was watching a television show called... Pettico Junction, I think it was, and somebody was leaving and they were playing Auld Lang Syne at the train station, and I, I thought I'd make it a little bit more authentic in terms of usually the, somebody uh, getting farewell of a boat, and um, so I did think it had possibilities, um, uh, but then I guess most songwriters think that about every song they've ever written, so, um, but I did think it had a possibility if it was done in the right way, and Fortunately, we seem to have done it in the right way, and it, it seemed to work. When you began writing for your own recordings rather than writing songs for others to, to do, did you find yourself consciously trying to write in a more personal kind of way? Uh, no, no, I just, uh, uh, after I'd moved to, uh, to Sydney, then went back to Queensland. Uh, I suppose when I was, was, was writing for the company in America, when they paid me to write every week, and... Uh, uh, advances against future oldies on which we were sort of living, I guess, and uh, uh, then I just wrote them as they came to me, and uh, some some of them were introspective songs, and uh, some of them, um, you know, uh, I, I've, I've never sort of sat down specifically to write in a certain vein, it's just how the song comes, how it works out, you know, you get an idea, and like many songwriters, um, you go wherever the song takes you. What do you recall of the construction of, of Rock and Roll I Gave You? I believe it was uh, relatively quick in, in writing. Yes, um, I was driving, I remember driving home and going to uh, Mosman, I think, when I first got the idea in Sydney. And um, I was living in the Northern Beaches and um, uh, I just got the idea of giving somebody the best years of my life and then I thought I'd make it closer to the mark, which was like the pursuit of success in the music vein. And... Um, uh, and that's how I, I wrote it. It came fairly quickly, and um, you know, in fact, the whole thing happened very quickly. We, uh, after I'd written it, I heard there were a number of versions uh, through this publishing company going out in America, in the United States, and uh, we decided to try and beat them. So we whipped in and recorded it, and uh, had it out on the American market, and actually in the charts before um, before anyone got their own their. their their versions out, so it was a bit of a race, but uh, it worked. As you say, what has been covered by many other people. Do you have a particular favourite cover of the song? Uh, maybe a cover that made you look at the song in a different way? Uh, no, uh, not looking at it in a different way. They all stayed fairly closely to uh, you know, how the song was constructed, and uh, but. Um, in terms of versions, I thought the Cats, who had a big hit with it in uh, Europe, uh, I, I suppose I had a big hit in more countries in Europe, but they had a big hit in, in Holland and you know a few other places. Uh, they did a very good job. Um, Joe Dessin, who was a French um, guy, I think he since died, but he did a good version. It was all in uh, French, of course, but. Uh, mm. And, uh, well, you know, Mac Davis was, was uh, good. Uh, in fact, actually, when I wrote it, I thought if anyone was going to cover this, it possibly would be suit Mac Davis. It didn't suit him as well as I thought it would have, but uh, it still, it was a big hit for him. And yeah. uh, he changed a few things, little lyrics, uh, which were totally unnecessary, I thought. But uh, he... Um, he gave it a happy it, ending, it, didn't he? Sorry? He gave it something of a happy ending, didn't he? Yeah, something like that, yes. Yeah. And also, there was no inference there that he'd never be a star sort of thing. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was a, a good version. Um, you know, obviously, financially, I'm glad he recorded it. Yeah. But, um, you know, there are many versions. In fact, I had a tape of the publisher had sent me from America, I think, of, um, of uh, many versions of it, which I 
loaned to some radio station, but I forgot to get it back, and yeah. uh, so, so I lost it. But I do have quite a few versions of the song, but there are many, many versions. It's it's a song that's more or less developed a, a life of its own. Has it been a hard song for you to live down over the years, with people constantly comparing your later work to it? Um, oh, you'll always get that, I suppose, but uh, I never really thought about that side of it. Um, obviously, it's better to have one of those, like, obviously, with Don McLean, it would have been, um, you know, uh, American Pie, and yeah. even though many people like Vincent Moore, uh, it's one of those things. But uh, over the years, fortunately, I've had a number of many songs of mine that have been people's favourites that they liked more than rock and roll. So, you know, it works uh, uh, that way. You know, I've got, um, as I said, some introspective things that, um, uh, you know, people related to more than rock and roll. So. Do you think uh, some of the best songs are the ones that come to you rather quickly like that one did, or...? rather than songs that are laboured over? Uh, generally speaking, I suppose I'd say yes. Um, uh, some things you labour over forever and uh, you finally get them right. But, uh, you know, some things just spontaneously happen. And, um, you know, that's you know there have been songs that, uh, that I've had over the years that uh, it came to you quickly because there was a certain emotion there, I suppose. And, mm. uh, uh, one of my... Uh, uh, I suppose uh, I've had um, a number of things that have been successful in other parts of the world. For instance, like I had songs about my two sons. Um, one was Shaney Boy, which has been uh, successful in, around the UK, Ar Ireland um, area. And uh, another one called Scotty, which is about my youngest boy, uh, Scott. And that was um, has also been successful in more on the continent, sort of in Europe. But... Um, and those are just a couple of ones that um, were more successful in other areas than, say, they were here. Uh, those two songs you mentioned, obviously two very special songs to you in your catalogue. Yeah. Uh, how, how do your boys look back on those songs now they're older and <laughs> than when yeah. they were written? Well, um, they've sort of, I suppose, they don't comment now because they've uh, lived with them all their lives, but um, they... Um, are both involved in the industry, so they, I suppose, understand the uh, uh, understand the emotional content of of, of these things. But uh, my uh, youngest boy, for instance, Scott, is uh, would be remembered by Melbourneites as being Tommy DeVito in uh, Jersey Boys, um, and um, so he played there for I think four or five hundred shows in Melbourne recently. So. Uh, He's in that business, and uh, um, as, uh, as you know, Tommy DeVito was the driving force of the Four Seasons, and uh, was a great part. But um, and uh, my other son Shane, he's a um, graduate as a film writer director, but he's working uh, at the moment um, while he's waiting for finance on a few things. Uh, the Sydney Theatre Company and the Opera House. He's just worked with Colin Friels and um, Brian Brown in the play then he worked with Steven Soderbergh the great American director recently uh, who did the sex lies and videotapes and um, uh, what else Erin Brockovich and a few other things so they're both uh, heavily involved in um, in in that sort of thing so mm -hmm. they would understand the songs well they do understand the songs and uh, understand because they're both in that creative side of things uh, outside of Australia, Europe's always been a, a great market for you. What, what triggered the, the European connection? I don't know. They just uh, It wasn't one I ever thought about. Um, I always thought in terms of America. Um, but um, it just happened to be that um, uh, Europe was um, a place that picked up on the stuff early. Uh, as I said, um, way, way back, um, I... Um, uh, one of them was picked up by John Jones at that stage recording in, uh, in, in England, I don't know where he records now but uh, so, you know, it was right back um, there was an interest there and I had my first um, thing that I did, I think uh, I think a woman you took my life that was picked up for release on Decker in England at that stage very few Australian records were getting picked up for overseas release and that was like uh, the late 60s I suppose so 
it uh, it was always an area that um, seemed to work for me. Um, America has too. I mean, I've been in the charts there, but um, uh, Europe has been consistently there. Yeah. Talking about your songwriting, has your method or or format of song songwriting changed much over the years? Do you still go about it the same way? Yes. Um, Yes, the same way. You get an idea, and you know the main part of the song comes as an idea quickly, and then you know it varies as to how long it takes you to finish them off. You know this is the problem because if if you come up with a great idea for the first verse, then all the other verses have to be as strong as that, and um, um, it's much the same uh, way. They're not always they don't always come in the same way. I mean, it's not always exactly the same trigger that's there but um, um, you know it varies but in terms of what I have done in terms of songwriting uh, it would, would be much the same throughout my entire career I guess uh, the same method of getting to the stage of saying well that's a finished song yes you, you've dabbled a little bit in, in writing for advertising over the years as well. How does that compare as a challenge writing for a client with a specific need as opposed to, to writing for yourself? Um, well, I um, haven't written that many that I actually sat down and wrote a specific song for the, the occasion. Like, say, if you took the AFL, that was a rewrite of one of my songs. And... Um, uh, if, if it was say AMP, well, it was really just uh, singing. Uh, You'll never walk alone, and um, uh, there weren't that many that I actually wrote. I suppose uh, there were a couple, but um, it's no different, I don't think, than writing for film, which uh, I've done as well. Um, and uh, <coughs> I, th I found that uh, somewhat uh, easier because you've got a vision there to carry it. Uh, or you start with a vision and you're writing to that vision um, uh, and it makes it a little bit easier than having to create the whole vision as well as the song you know in the, in the listener's mind so um, it's not easy of course but um, uh, I, and I've worked on a few films and a few uh, commercials so uh, generally I didn't uh, didn't mind the exercise at all uh, the AFL one's an interesting one. Do, were you initially comfortable in, in doing that? Did it take some persuading? It took some persuading and the talk of money. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, every man had his choice. But uh, it took a long time. The negotiations went on there for a long time. And uh, But in the end, um, I agreed to do it. And uh, it was a great experience. They were a very good uh, mob to work with. The AFL, they did things in style. And, um, you know, we... Um, had a, a good time uh, during the uh, the season that it was used. I might have been used for two seasons. I can't remember, but uh, certainly I was involved physically, uh, going to the big matches sort of thing in that first year, the centenary year. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a good experience. And um, as I said, they were good good uh, people to work with. So um, uh, my wife uh, Jill and I uh, flew around the country. I suppose. Um, quite a bit uh, during that year and uh, doing the song and um, and as well I had to re-record it and rewrite the, the lyrics and whatever for it but um, it was a good experience and um, but uh, then the song reverts back to its original what it was yeah <coughs> but um, yes um, it was um, something I wasn't terribly keen on the first um uh, discussions but as it went on we uh, we come to an agreement and uh, we did it and in hindsight it certainly hasn't done any harm to, to the memory of the song at all really has it no no I think uh, I think if you if you were singing about dog food or something like that uh, in, in strict strictly commercial way <coughs> it might have but uh, when you're talking about ASL you're talking about a song that's very uh, uh, conjures up great passionate uh, memories and uh, interest among people around Australia. So it's, you know, a lot of people, it's their favourite sport. So, you know, it couldn't really do any harm to be singing it in an endearing way uh, yeah. about this, their sport. That's true. Uh, performance wise, you've, you've kept a reasonably low profile in recent years. At this stage of your career, is it, is it more quality rather than quantity of, of gigs that you're looking for? Um, 
I've never sort of consciously uh, avoided uh, doing shows, but uh, then I sort of never ever been on. Well, maybe I was right at the very start doing sort of thing every weekend. There'd be something on somewhere, a few shows, um, but I've never done that in recent times. I sort of blocked them all together and did the, you know a few over the course of a few weeks or a month or whatever. And uh, that would be it. Uh, in recent times, I've done very little in that regard. I intend to do some more, um, but um, uh, when it will happen, I'm not sure. But I've been talking like that for quite a few years, <laughs> so I'll have to, to get, uh, to get uh, moving on that project. But uh, it's certainly a thing I have um, not consciously avoided, but it's just um, uh, you know getting it all together and making it happen. Yeah. And, um, I certainly intend doing that very soon. One thing you did do in recent times was team up with uh, fellow singer-songwriters Doug Ashtown and Mike McCullen. They must have been some uh, fun shows. Yes, uh, they worked very well as shows. Uh, we did a number of basements, uh, the basement in Sydney, which is like a, uh, well, it's an established sort of acoustic bluesy, uh, jazzy sort of uh, establishment. But... Um, we did a number of shows there over a couple of different years, and uh, they were very successful. And we did a few others as well around the place, um, but um, they worked very well. We just haven't uh, <coughs> had the opportunity to get together again uh, to do it, but um, you know, we we may again. It just seemed to work. Uh, in the three personalities were totally different, and uh, it uh, fired as a show, uh, and. Uh, uh, I guess one of these days we may do some more. And just a couple of things before I let you go, Kevin. Upcoming plans, is there anything musically on, on the horizon for you that we can look forward to? I've got um, a number of things uh, written that I've been writing for the last couple of years. I've been uh, stockpiling a few songs together and um, uh, certainly looking to uh, record some of these. Um, and um, as I said, I... Uh, you know, sell on the, uh, we sell direct uh, in on the, at my website um, around the world. So uh, people looking after that, but uh, that's sort of thing where <coughs> orders come in all the time from many countries. The great thing, I suppose, about the internet in that if somebody in Iceland wants to re- order one of your records, you don't have to go through the shops or whatever. But... Um, so that's always an area that keeps us uh, busy, and uh, all of the product is there. But um, uh, apart from that, I've, as I said, um, uh, working on new material and the idea of doing some new, more shows, um, and um, hopefully that will um, will happen Fantastic. fairly soon. And the best piece of career advice you could give to a to a young singer songwriter just starting out. Um, it's very difficult to say what you say in this t- day and age. Um, things are not exactly the same. Once upon a time, there were about, <coughs> I don't know how many, uh, independent radio stations across the United States of America, and any one of them could just pick up a record if they liked it and played it, and it just sort of spread from there, which is how many of the great hits worked. Those days, unfortunately, are no longer with us. So... Uh, I, it's very difficult what you'd say. I, I don't know. You say that, it, you know, if you believe you've got something to offer, by all means go for it because you ought to be sorry if you didn't. Mm. And uh, just keep persevering, but uh, it's not an easy road. It's it's a harder road these days for uh, anybody with real things to say. I don't mean people who are just sort of following the trends or whatever where it's easier to get in perhaps but uh anything anyone with real uh, ideas and it's not never easy and it's certainly not easy now but just keep plugging away there and uh, yeah, hopefully it'll happen that's great advice hey kevin thanks so much for for taking time out to, to chat with us today and thank you for a, a wonderful body of work over the years and we are hoping that there'll be more to come thank you very much it's been great to talk to you all the best take care bye bye bye